Good evening, everyone. Let's try that again. She, she sort of led you guys to understand what it is this is going to be about. So good evening, everyone. So that was probably the best introduction I've ever received. So that's that was impressive. And, and I wasn't going to rhyme at all today, but in, in the spirit of hip hop, I just got a battery, right? So uh, I'm a science educator, so I'll open this up with a little bit of a science rhyme. Um, I'm a physicist slash lyricist. I smash ignorance. It's a miss when I'm spitting this. Newton's laws of motion be the topic of this course, because things in motion stay in motion unless they hit in a balanced force. Next up, second law of situation and summation. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's the second law Newton foresaw. If you want more, the third law is in store. So every force has an opposite force, and every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The sum of all objects at rest is zero, unless the object's no longer relaxing. I'm in motion, change in location, till it hits traction, coefficient of friction. Then it all comes to a full stop, and there goes Newton laws over hip hop. All right. So now that I a little bit of entertainment, I'm hoping that I can um, share some words about my research and about, about an issue that is at the core of, of my being. It, it's what drives every piece of who I am. Um, and I am honored to be here in your presence to share this work. And um, in doing so, I hope that you leave here with at least something that you can carry back to your work. Whether you're an educator or an administrator or someone who works in higher education, just leave with one thing that you can carry with you. So the title of the talk is Reality Pedagogy, Teaching and Learning from a Student Standpoint. And the term reality pedagogy may be something that you don't hear quite often. You know, the question is like, what is reality? We can't even quite define that. What is pedagogy? Those of you who are in ed classes have probably heard that ad nauseum, you know, beat you to death with the term pedagogy. Pedagogy is the science of teaching and learning. Reality pedagogy is teaching and learning from the reality of the student's experience. And that is something that has roots in everything in education, from, from, from Dewey to, to Piaget, understanding the, 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 the interest of the student. But I'm here talking about not just the interest of the student, but the reality of the student's experience. See, in education, there are these terms. One of the most popular ones that we all sort of love is this idea of culturally relevant pedagogy culturally responsive pedagogy. And that work has such power. The, the, the educators who've done the work in that field have changed the game completely and helped teachers to see teaching in a new way. But I make the argument that culturally relevant or culturally re responsive pedagogy is like pushing the, the boulder all the way up to the edge of the cliff. It's right there, and then we walk away. That, that term, despite its power, is pushing you right to the cusp we're not getting to the goal of getting students to be truly interested. I argue that to get students to be truly interested, we have to focus on the realities of their experiences. Because culturally relevant pedagogy is truly the teacher's perspective of what the culture is of the student. So you can say I'm being culturally relevant by assuming what the culture is. And if you're assuming what the culture is, that is laden with all your preconceptions. So the work is not to stop at cultural relevance is to make cultural relevance the first step, and then you immerse yourself in the reality of the student experience. And what I'm hoping to share with you today are some tools to be able to do so. So, another quick time out, because you guys are looking at me like, all oh, serious now, <laughs> right? When we teach, we teach and learn, it has to be a fun experience. You can't just be all, you know, scared of what he's gonna say next. So I'll, I'll break the ice with this. Um, I'll know when to go next, because I'll say, can I proceed? And those of you who know hip hop means that you respond by saying, yes, indeed. So can I proceed? Yes, indeed. That's much better, much better. <laughs> so now let's look at these pictures, these images I have here. That's actually um, President Obama with who he deems to be the best science and math teachers in the country. And I, I talked to, through, about this work through the lens of a scientist, a science educator, as you can tell by my physics rap. And so just, just look at that picture. Don't say anything, just look at it and soak that in. And then look at the third picture. And the third picture are the youth in classrooms that you guys are going to be working in, particularly the TFA folks. You're going to the schools where you're needed the most, where the demographics are quite interesting um, and quite different from that you may expect in a traditional school. So look at those things there. Do you see anything interesting? Who said that? The one person who's like not scared. Well, yes. Uh, 
Th that is interesting. And, and usually when I ask that question, it takes a while. People are like, well, um, they're teachers. Um, they, they're looking at him. No, they, they're all from a different cultural background. And the first step in us getting to a point where we can get into understanding the reality of students' experiences is to really confront the fact that students are different from the teacher, the teaching populace. Like, if you can't talk about that first, um, you can't get anywhere. You with me, right? So that's the first and foremost. Right there, Obama is like a drop of chocolate in a bowl of milk, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's just the reality of it, right? And at the same time, we're looking at the youth and, and, and on the other side, and then we have this idea of this, this idea of science for all Americans, right? Science for all Americans, engaging all youth in the disciplines. Um, but I would argue that that can actually go away because we can't talk about science for all Americans first without addressing the cultural divides that exist, which were alluded to earlier. Now, the cultural divides are based on ethnicity and race. They're also based on age. By virtue of being over 25 years old and stepping into a classroom, there is a divide right there. I felt it. And so the first thing we have to do is sort of confront all the existing divides. Like, because there's an age difference, how do I understand youth culture? Because there's an ethnicity difference, how do I understand the race and class backgrounds of the students in front of me? Because there's a gender difference when you're dealing with black males who are oftentimes most ostracized in these schools, what is it about that demographic that historically have turned them off to schools? And what role am I going to play in either maintaining said achievement gaps and maintaining the fact that these youth are not engaged in school and engaged in science or do something revolutionary? What I want to share with you today is that a reality-based pedagogy is necessarily a revolutionary act. That teaching is not apolitical. Teaching is not divorced from understanding the cultural things that are going on. It's not divorced from understanding that a piece like, um, if I were a poor black kid, I would change my life. Or, or the fact that youth in classrooms are being arrested at rates that are ridiculous in comparison to others from the same background. That teaching is not ignoring those issues. Teaching is actually making sure you're deeply embedded in those issues. Because if you don't embed yourself in those issues, you cannot be an effective pedagogue. That reality is understanding what people are feeling and experiencing every day. And that's the step from which we move forward. So can I proceed? So that moves away. That moves away. And then we have to look at a bunch of demographic issues, or, or more, not even demographic issues, more structural issues. That picture there, that, 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 that image there, is actually me. And why I say that's me is because I can imagine myself in high school being this kid. Pants baggy, well, right now they're skinny. I don't know, the you a jerk movie, right? But pants baggy headphones on in the classroom. And although they might not be physically on, they're always on because the music is playing in my head. And sitting there asking what's next in this place because I can't wait to get out of here. And I learned for a very long time that if I sat quietly, I'd be left alone enough and I wouldn't have to engage. And if I was docile enough and quiet enough, that I can pass, that I can sit in the back of the science class unconscious, though everything that the teacher's saying is nonsense, that I wouldn't raise my hand because I'd avoid a conflict, because if I raise my hand, I'm not the one he's going to pick. And so I sit there, my mind in another place, rapping to myself in a different time, a different place, displaced because I can't keep pace. I can't wait for the bell so I can make my escape. And that narrative is the experience of black males in classrooms, and black females in classrooms, and poor white folks in classrooms as well. And so what role will you play in addressing those issues is first understanding that that's the feeling. And when you understand that's the feeling, then you have to find out how do they engage? Because they're not learning in a traditional classroom. It's just not happening. We're afraid to confront that, but that's the reality. Folks are being successful in classrooms who are from these marginalized populations. It does happen, but the reality is that that is occurring in spite of the schools, not because of the schools. I'll say that again. Folks always critique the work that's pushing the agenda forward by saying, but, but what do you mean? There's a black president. 
Like, what do you mean some folks are graduating? Like, what do you mean not everybody's failing? And the reality is that the people who are successful in the existing school system that are of color and marginalized are successful in spite of schooling, not because of it. And that's why the successful person who's from a marginalized background is an anomaly. If the reality was that they were being successful because of schooling, there'd be a lot more folks from those marginalized populations within the Ivy Tower. So now we have to understand that what engages them? If they're not teaching and learning in classrooms, where is that happening? It's happening in hip hop. Because hip hop has evolved to become a form of education. That has been a place where cultural relevance has existed. Cultural relevance has not existed within a traditional classroom. That's where student-centered instruction has existed. These are terms that we all love, like student-centered instruction. That's like buzzword galore. People love that. Then you ask them, what does it mean to be student-centered? Um, 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 no concrete answer. Because what's happened is powerful terms have become co-opted. And what I mean by co-opted is it's become a part of the lexicon. See, what happens when the language of folks who have not been allowed in become allowed in is that their words become taken and used as a badge of honor to say that you're addressing those issues. If you haven't addressed the cultural issues I opened up with, if you haven't addressed the fact that youth aren't learning in classrooms, and then you're saying you're student-centered and you're culturally relevant, you're lying. And education is about truth. Truth to the experience of the self that comes to the classroom and understanding the truth of the learner. That's their reality. So I look at hip hop because that's where I see teaching and learning. My focus on hip hop is not just because I love the artifact of hip hop, although I do. I don't just focus on hip hop education because I rap and I'm nice, which is true, right? But, but I focus on hip hop because those are the spaces where teaching and learning in the way that makes sense to those populations, that's where I see it. The four elements of hip hop are b-boying, breakdancing, rapping, and graffiti. What does a rap artist do to command his audience? He stands there and he talks and moves with his hands. And the hands are the way through which you describe the words that are coming out of your mouth. If I'm talking about something on a micro scale, it's a micro scale. If it's macro scale, it's macro scale. If I'm dropping science, I'm moving my hands because it is just a point which I'm describing something with vivid imagery, with metaphor and analogy. That my teaching is not just my words, it's my persona. It's the self I give off. That is a part of teaching and learning that we're not getting in teacher education programs. This should be a class that starts off with the pedagogy of rap, how to engage an audience through hand movements, gestures, and verb. Because for a population that's deeply immersed in those things by watching rap and hip hop and being that, that being a part of their tradition, that is how we learn. That is how we teach. That is an oral culture. And so from rap, we learn that piece. From b-boying, we learn what? What's a b-boy do a break dancer? He moves. That even if there's a rap performance, there are b-boys in the background and the b-boys will interrupt the space in order to move and, and, and express self. In a 40 minute classroom lesson, when you're preparing a lesson plan, how many spaces have you created in the midst of that lesson for there to be movement? If a generation is immersed in movement, the culture they are a piece of says whenever that I'm going through a performance, there has to be a space for movement. Hip hop tells us that to engage that person, you need to have verb and movement. If that does not exist in your classroom, if that's not a piece of your lesson plan, then you are enacting a non-culturally relevant pedagogy. Hip hop also has graffiti. I'm not advocating for vandalizing property. <laughs> I am saying though, let's look back at the core of why graffiti exists or existed. The initial graffiti artists would sneak out at night when there was no police, go into the New York City subway system where there was a third rail and if they stepped on could electrocute them. So they were risking their lives to sneak through a tunnel and get on a train and put on that train their name. And that name would be in bold letters, and it'd be an alias. And I knew that if it was on that train, then it would travel all around the city. And even though in their classroom they were silenced and had no voice, and were not validated, on that train, the world as they knew it would know their name. 
is the eternal search for fame and visibility. Where in the instruction is there space for that? I'm not talking about putting up work on a classroom wall and saying that's visibility. Nobody wants to be visible amongst 25 people. The graffiti artists want to be visible across the city. So what spaces are we creating in the community of the learners where they're accepted and validated for their intelligences? Why does the classwork have to be only posted in the classroom? Why can't it be posted in a pizza shop? Or in the community? Why can't the award ceremony leave the school and go out into the community? Because the search for fame is eternal. It's part and parcel of being a part of hip hop. And by not giving youth the ability to be visible in their own localized places, we're enacting a non-culturally relevant pedagogy. The last piece of hip hop is DJing. DJs in hip hop began their craft by taking a disco record that they found quite annoying. Well, maybe that's just a personal opinion on disco, I'm sorry. And it would take 35 seconds of that record where no one was singing, no one was talking, and find a breakbeat, a small piece of rhythm. And they would take another turntable and find that same small pace, space, and they would flip back and forth between 35 seconds on one record and the other until they could build into a seven minute track they could talk over. What is that? That is the space to manipulate technology. These are tools for how we can teach for those folks taking the technology that existed and having the space and creativity to manipulate that technology until it met their specific needs was educational. That's the seedbed of technology. In your school, when you go and teach, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna get technology. Then a couple months later, something new is gonna come out. And when something new comes out, it's gonna go up in your classroom. And then the old technology will either be thrown away or be put in the basement of the school. And that is nonsensical just for the fact that it's a waste of money. But second, because for youth who are involved in learning through play and manipulation of technology, you have to put the technology in front of them. If it's old and it's not gonna be used anymore, that's an engineering and mathematics class. Take apart the computer. Find out why it's working. Rip the, destroy something. But learn through it. Because it would be, be useless anyway. And so these are four major strands of hip hop that give us complete inroads into the culture of youth. Mind you, though I opened up with a rap, the rap is only the hook. Pun intended, if you know what rap, hook, did I'm ching, no? All right, I'll try again next time. But it's, it's only the hook. Rap is actually simply a superficial strand of the complexity of hip hop. If you want to enact a hip hop based pedagogy, you have to go back to the root and understand these larger structures. Where else are spaces where youth who've been marginalized are engaging? What is that? Okay, everybody knows that. Social media. Social media includes Facebook, and now people are like, Facebook, I'm off that, I'm on Twitter now, right? Who here is on Twitter, by the way? Just curious, look at that, right? Now, what is the role of social media? Do you know that on Twitter, it was Ashton Kutcher, his wife or ex-wife, and, and, and a slew of rappers were the early adopters of Twitter. Did you realize that? That social media actually is a part and parcel of the complexity of hip hop culture. That it, because it provides an avenue for voice, it provides an avenue for engaging with audiences across settings, it provides an avenue for fame, and it can sort of enact these, these, these sort of communal spaces within a social media platform. But in traditional classrooms, that's not accepted. There have been eons of articles and, 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 and people advocating for, let's, let's try Facebook in the classroom, let's try social media in the classroom. And what have we heard? No, we can't do it. It's unsafe. Well, the reason why it's unsafe is because we haven't adopted them to use them in classrooms so we can teach the youth to use them appropriately. If people are arguing that bullying starts on Facebook, and it's a problem, so you won't use it in a classroom. How about you utilize it in the classroom and teach youth how to engage with it properly? Like, it's common sense. <laughs> right? If Twitter is a place where this entire populace is gathering, almost everybody's hands were up. Almost everyone's hands were up. Why is that not being explored as a tool with which we can use to engage youth? Have a hashtag of science or math and have your class convene there and engage in the dialogue right there. That's where the youth are. That is culturally responsive pedagogy. I heard a story once, 
about a man who walked into the class and saw a classroom in the 1800s. And so he walks into the classroom and he has an audience with him and he goes in for the first time and he sees a class and everybody's sitting down in the class. And as he sits down in the class, he walks in and he looks up and he's like, what is that? And so he picks up his journal and starts writing notes. And he's like, I walk into the room and there was a board. It was painted black. And underneath it were these, were these pieces of white material and a cloth attached by the side. It's technology. I don't know what to do with it. You know what he was describing? The chalkboard. And we all looking like, what an idiot. It's a chalkboard. But without focusing on the use of social media and phenomena that's embedded in youth life worlds, you are doing the same darn thing. So can I proceed? Yes, indeed. And then lastly, although it was part of hip hop before, again, the idea of performance. DJ Khaled, who's a rapper, well, I wouldn't necessarily call him a rapper, but he's an artist. I wouldn't necessarily call him an artist. He's a, he's a character, right? He has a song, and of course the song goes, and every time I step up in the building, everybody's hands go up, and actually people's hands just went up, literally. <laughs> And they stay there and the hands go up, right? And they stayed there. Like, no one could pay me to just put my hand up for no reason. I wouldn't do it, right? But people, he has a crowd of 100,000 in the performance whose hands go up and stay there. Then he says, up, down, up, down, and their hands go up and down and up, down and up, down. And if he said, stop, do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around, they would all do it. What is it about that experience that we can use as educators? Like each of those moments that capture the imaginations of our youth are the tools through which we revolutionize our practice. Like that is the nexus of culturally relevant responsive pedagogy, kicking the cliff over and enacting reality pedagogy. So can I proceed? Yes, indeed. So while I've made these larger critiques, I want to move on to another larger issue of how we see education in the United States. We see education in the United States as a pretty building. Like, isn't that a nice house? Wouldn't you like to live there? It, it, it's like well manicured. There are like flowers out front. Um, there's a chimney in the back. It's perfect. The skies are perfect. And that's how we view and we present education. That all is well. Nothing's going wrong. Right? It, it's just so pretty. But the idea is that if the outside is pretty and we don't focus on the structure that holds up the home, we have a problem. And beyond looking at the structure of the home, if we don't look really deeply at the fact that termites by infesting the home, there's a problem. And what is the structure of the home made of? Wood, right? And what color is wood? What color is it? Is it a color? The color of wood? It's brown. I, I'm trying to push you there, people. It's brown. It's brown. It's brown. It's brown. And so if the structure of the home and the wood is brown, and we're ignoring the structure of the home that's holding it up, but we still have this pretty picture, would it make a difference if you put up wallpaper? No. You can put up wallpaper, paint, put up a new roof. If the structure of the home has not been focused on and not paid attention to, the house will fall down. And I, I believe that multiculturalism, as much as I love folks who love multiculturalism and do that work, I embrace you, I want to hug you from a distance at all times. But multiculturalism has become a term with which we've used to put wallpaper on the fact that the rotting structure of the brown wood holding up our society exists. In addition, so has been terms like NCLB, No Child Left Behind. Because it sounds great, it sounds pretty. But if it's a pretty picture, and it's not meeting the needs of the populace that's holding up the structure, the house will fall down. And so I don't care if it's No Child Left Behind, race to the top, race to the bottom, race around the block, all children left behind, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter at all what it is. Genuinely, it matters not what it is. If our schools of education and our teachers are not willing to confront that, the major issue in education is truly cultural divides. That is the core of it. 
If we cannot focus on the fact that people of color who are marginalized and are in urban settings have a different way of looking at the world than other people, if you can't accept that, you, you could leave none or all behind. So can I proceed? All right, I'm glad y'all still with me. All right, so just throw out some stats, just to, to, to sort of really make that point really clear. Minorities, classified as those of any race other than non-Hispanic, single white, race whites, currently constitute about a third of the US population. By 2042, they are projected to become the majority, making up more than half the population. Th that in itself is oxymoronic, like minorities would be the majority. So, whatever, all right? <laughs> And 54% of the population of minorities, by 2023, more than half of the children will be minorities. Now, some of you are focused on, on, on race and ethnicity issues. You're saying, wow, this is crazy. And we can appeal to folks who are focused on race and ethnicity issues. But this is a reason for us to be able to focus or lobby to folks who are in interested in issues concerning the national standings. So like, if you can say, listen, I don't necessarily care about black and brown folks in classrooms. Although people won't say that, you can tell by their talk. That's what they are saying. But you have to also understand that if a population who is ignored in schooling is now the numerical majority and their cultural needs have not been met in classrooms, then it doesn't any longer affect individual groups. It affects national standings. I'm going to let you just sit with that. I'm not even going to say can I proceed. Just think about that. And of course, I'm an advocate for STEM, and these issues in STEM are even larger. One out of 18 workers will be employed in a STEM occupation. STEM workers command 26% higher wages than non-STEM workers. Less than half of high school graduates are actually prepared for math, and a third are prepared for college-level science. One state alone of California will need 1,148,000 new STEM jobs by 2018. And put all those things in perspective with the fact that we have all these issues in education, but the achievement gaps are tripled, literally tripled, when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And one of my favorite sayings is this, stem with no root, bears no fruit. Repeat after me, stem with no root, bears no fruit. Stem with no root, bears no fruit. If you have a plant, and that's a stem, and you want it to have a fruit at the end of it. Will you ever bear fruit if you're not in the root? Like, if, it, if you don't plant first, right? Will that happen? So a stem of a plant without any root or grounding will not bear any fruit. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. As a nation, we need fruit, people who will go into these disciplines. But no one wants to look at the root. And the root is where? Like, where do you find the root? Say it loud. Underground. And is underground clean or a nice place to play in? No. When you're going underground and you're planting, like your fingernails get dirty, it's uncomfortable, you're like, dude, I don't want to do this. But you want at the end to get the fruit, so you have to go there first. So what's underground? Huh? Dirt, worms, grime, hip hop. That's underground. I'll skip these stats. If you want the slides later, I'll give them to you. Hip hop is underground. And hip hop is underground where kids are lively. A rap concert, they're moving. But in classrooms, all I see is this. He's sleeping, she's sleeping, she's trying to hold her head up, but sleeping. His hoodie is half on, so he's completely disinterested. He's sleeping, and he's, what's he doing? What does he look like he's doing? I don't know what he's doing. All I know is his head is down, and it might look like disengagement. But these are snapshots of the traditional classroom when you have youth who've been marginalized. This is either the picture, it's one of three things. They either head down and half asleep, Number one, two, making sure you have a very hard time, or three, not showing up at all. And the argument I'm making is that each of those three instances is actually the same thing. Each of those things are a marker of the fact that these youth should be viewed as the neo-indigenous. Now I know some of you are like, here comes the professor with, um, you know, neo-indigenous. Let me tell you why I'm gonna use the term neo-indigenous. So, 
As a nation, we've gotten to a point where we have collectively agreed that <coughs> folks who are indigenous First Nations people have been oppressed by the nation. Like, we've collectively agreed on that. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody who says, no, that's not the case. So if we've agreed on that, let's look at the characteristics that help us to identify who we classify as indigenous folks. First Nation people, Maori in New Zealand, wherever it is, who are the indigenous? The indigenous are folks who have distinct linguistic traditions. People with close ties to their places of origin. People who have gone through a schooling process that have oppressed them forever and a day. And people who we still view as almost invisible in many spaces. And we've agreed that those characteristics can help us to identify folks as indigenous. Well, how about we make the argument that urban youth in classrooms are the neo-indigenous? Why? Because they share the same characteristics as indigenous folks, distinct linguistic traditions. If I'm in New York, it's, yo, what up, son? If I'm in ACL, it's, what up, shawty? Like, those, those, those manipulations of the language, they, 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 they call forth a certain distinct linguistic tradition, which I would argue is a search for having a space that's outside of the norm because I've been pushed out of the norm. So I identify my own discourse and linguistic patterns. So, so distinct language, close ties to places of origin. I can't listen to a rap album and not know exactly where the rapper is from. Like Snoop is from Long Beach, uh, T.I. is from ATL. Not only is he from ATL, he's from Bankhead. Like I know his block, I know everything. By listening to the album, what does that tell me? It tells me there's a, a close tie to the places of origin because that block, that's all I own. That's my space. So we have the language, we have the space, is the space issues, and we have the fact that, yes, they have been oppressed in schools as well. Urban youth are the neo-indigenous. When we hear a tale about indigenous populations who were moved out of their different places that they were tied to, pulled out of those spaces and put into schools and told that they were gonna be Americanized in those schools, and what we did with, the, with that population is they, 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 they took off their native garb, their modes of discourse, they put on uniforms on them, and they, and they sat in rows, and they took pictures. Like, look at that picture. Does anyone look happy? I see fear, frustration, anger. This is a process of Americanizing populations in schools. That looks just like this a couple decades later. That looks just like this a week ago. Despite all our language about education reform and revolutionizing practice, just the structures and schooling spaces alone let us know that we've gone nowhere. This is an auditorium, and I'm engaging with you, and you're sitting and watching me. And, and I love Elon, it's an amazing place. But, but, but this example calls forth a certain tradition that we have in schools and academic spaces, which says, sage on stage, sit and learn. I will give you all I know. You will go out and conquer the world. In fact, I would, in a traditional classroom, stand here. That's why this is here. The way it's supposed to go down is that I come up and I say thank you so much. It was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> And now I'll present, and I click. And then you look, then I click. And then you look, then I click some more. <laughs> but that's the traditional structure. And so urban youth must be viewed as neo-indigenous. So can I proceed? Yes. So I think y'all like waiting for answers now. So I gotta move on. Like I, I had clips, but I I'm gonna skip one clip, and I'm gonna skip two clips also because I want to get you guys a solution. So how do we solve these issues? I would argue that it's through reality pedagogy. What is reality pedagogy? It is Pentecostal pedagogy plus reality pedagogy, well, Pentecostal pedagogy equals reality pedagogy. Now, what do I mean by Pentecostal pedagogy? I'm, I'm trying to give you a lesson. It's like a lecture, like you're, you're with me. What, is Pen, what does Pentecostal mean? What, is, what does it mean when you hear the term Pentecostal? What, what words pop up in your head? Huh? Church? How many of you in here have been to a black church? All right, a couple of people. Now, 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 
Part of what I'm telling you guys is that you have to look in different spaces. You have to look in places you've never seen before for the inspiration for education. Do you know that the black church is like the perfect example of teaching and learning? Particularly for populations who are outside of the scope of, who are not successful in traditional schooling. Let me tell you what the pastor does. The pastor comes up, right? And then he comes up, and then he has his Bible, and he starts, he starts doing his thing. And the pastor, just like the rapper, has movement, like the hands are going the whole time. Like the hands are showing you what you should be learning. Educators write that down. Hands are part of my instruction, right? In fact, if you're tweeting, like tweet it right now, like hands are part of instruction, it says at Chris Emden, right? So, so the pastor does that, right? And I'm serious, I'm gonna check my tweets later, make sure you do it. So, and, then, and so the pastor does that, and then the pastor also, he starts reading his Bible scriptures, right? Because he's referencing text. Because the best instructors don't just give text, they reference text. So he gives the text, then he espouses. Text, move on. That's what he does. Then he collects money. You can't quite do that. Sorry, right? <laughs> but, but in the traditional black church, there's always a point where there's a break where he's, the pastor says, okay, uh, just say hi to your neighbor. And everybody gets up and they give hugs and they dance and they move, right? And what is that? It's an understanding that in any social space where there's teaching and learning, the opportunity for movement and birth, just like in breakdancing, has to occur. Like this is part of a history of black tradition that has evolved to become a hip hop pedagogy. And so therefore in the classroom we have to adopt the same things. So I actually give you time to greet each other. Do you give the students an opportunity to greet each other in the classroom? It's a powerful tool. In fact, if you stop the classroom and give a break in time for the students to greet each other, they won't be fighting to try to greet each other for the rest of the 40 minutes while you're trying to teach them a lesson. It's true. And so when the pastor does that, they all greet each other and he goes back to his text. Now what happens when the pastor starts preaching and he realizes that Sister Brown is in the back of the church and she's going to sleep? What, what does she do? What does he do then? Huh? He's like, and so, then he gets to spit, you know, he's just, then he gets to going. And then Sister Brown is like, okay, I'm with you again, right? And, and, and so what is, what is that a lesson from? Voice inflection, intonation, right? that you, when, you, when you lull the crowd with the text and story, and you build to a crescendo, and then you get them to say amen, right? And, and, and the amen is analogous to like, oh, which is the most beautiful sound to a teacher's ear. But that comes with how you create the narrative as an instructor, and that is hip hop pedagogy, which is birthed in what I term a Pentecostal pedagogy, to engage the youth who are not engaged in classrooms today. So, any, any sociologists in the building? No? No one? All right, I'll skip this slide then. <laughs> I, I really wanted to talk about the slide, but since there are no theorists, so, so this is another thing a good educator does is realize when, you know what, that's overkill. On to the next one. So I'm gonna skip. And, and this clip here is a young man who was sleeping before. Watch him. The so teacher asked a question. So he offers an answer. He looks around, does one of these, gives another answer. Another answer. Another answer. Another answer. That is a singular experience that's an analogy for what happens in the classroom. Attempts to engage, no opportunity to do so. A persistent engagement, practice, attempt over time that results in that. And remember when we started the first clip and I showed you all those pictures? That was the last kid when I said, I don't know what he's doing. Because oftentimes, societally, we don't know what's going on. Because we fail to recognize that the attempts to engage have not been met with anything. When someone makes an attempt to engage, you have to attempt to connect. You can't attempt to connect by ignoring. And we've, what we've done is ignore. So how do you engage this young man? 
I won't even just give you questions. You guys have to invite me back to do all the slides that I skipped over, right? Um, let, let's get to the answers. This is all cool stuff. The core of reality pedagogy. Reality pedagogy has five C's. Five C's. The first of the C's is called the cipher. C-Y-P-H-E-R, or the cogen. Question might be to you, like, what the heck is a cipher? A cipher is something that's part and parcel of hip hop. You two are involved in hip hop. Let's say I'm a rapper and I'm a corner, on a corner. I might start rapping to myself. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, my niece's boyfriend comes up and he's like, um, I'm a rapper too. So he starts rapping also, right? So I'm rapping, he's rapping. Then somebody else comes up and he starts rapping. And organically, we don't know each other from anywhere. We converge into a social space and we have these rules of engagement for communicating with each other. That's what a cipher is in hip hop. You have four rappers, five rappers, six rappers who come and stand in a circle, equidistant from each other, with equal turns that talk, with no voice privilege over the other, sharing ideas using, using metaphor and analogy in the moment. And when the next person wants to rap, let's say I'm rapping, he doesn't just like raise his hand and say, um, excuse me, can you pick me to rap next? That doesn't happen, right? He doesn't nudge me. He just gives more emphatic head nods and a slow uh, uh, right? And then a movement. And by his movement and his gestures, I instinctively know that it's time for me to end my rap and allow him to take the helm of the conversation. And everybody's looking at each other and there's eye contact, entrainment, collective effervescence. These are rules of engagement that occur everywhere in hip hop. They occur just really quickly. Now I have to go back. No, I'll go forward. Okay, I'll go forward. It, they occur in, in, in a number of different places. I've seen ciphers occur it, here in Nairobi, Kenya, in Johannesburg, South Africa, in Namibia, and in LA without meeting people, but they know the way to communicate. So if you know the way to communicate intrinsically, why can't we bring this structure into the classroom? Why can't we just solve a math problem, have five students stand in a circle equidistant from each other, going back and forth in the steps to solve the problem? So they co-generate the plan of action to solve that problem. That's an easier thing to do than just to give a question and accept, expect an answer. Why? Because they know that structure already. What does that address? Classroom management, collaboration, group work, knock all the birds out with one stone, what they do already. Another way we've used the cogenerative dialogue is to have youth tell you about what your teaching is like. Novel idea. Which is, if I'm in a classroom and I'm teaching, and you're always getting 100 in all my tests because you're brilliant, and you're getting a 20 in all my tests because you're more brilliant, which is oftentimes the case. I don't know if you guys follow me, right? You're getting 100 on all the tests because you're brilliant. You're getting a 20 on all the tests because you're probably more brilliant. Not that you're not brilliant, sir. <laughs> you're always engaged and you're not engaged at all. I take each of those students who represent different demographics in the classroom to engage in a conversation with me about what's working well for them and what's not. And we co-generate a plan of action for improving the class next. So you got the story. When I was a teacher, I did this, I, I brought the students together and I said, you know, you guys just let me know what we can do to improve this classroom. Let's co-generate a plan of action. They said, um, Dr. E, you're always yelling. I was like, me? Yell? Never. You're like, I'm the coolest teacher ever. And they're like, no, you, you really do. Um, and I, I was like, you know what, this co-gen is over. Just, you know, keep the door open, right? So, and so this occurred in this space and, and then I also did a project where I did a lot of videoing in classrooms, and I talked to some folks about that before. So what happened is the young man was videoing my classrooms. He went home, and he started, he went on iMovie, and he created a three-minute video of me yelling. <laughs> the same exact way, but with different outfits on. So it was like, ah, 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 all around. And he brought that back to that space. It was like, um, you yell. I'm like, no, I don't yell. Well, watch this, you know, and I'm, I'm confronted with self. But, but, but what that example does is you create an opportunity for the kids to be able to analyze your instruction and give you suggestions for improvement. If youth are in traditional classrooms and are old and don't have an opportunity to express voice, and you are not cult you're culturally relevant, but you don't understand their reality, the only way you can understand their reality is by creating a social space outside of the space of the classroom where they can give you some insight into said reality so you can use that insight to amend your pedagogy. And that's a cycle. And a cypher has roots in hip-hop. The second C 
is this idea of co-teaching. Now, all of you teachers or aspiring teachers, co-teaching to you means that there's the main teacher, then there's the teacher on the side who like makes the copies and get the coffee. I'm not talking about that version of co-teaching. I'm talking about co-teaching where we put the teaching in the hands of the students. Co-teaching is when you put the teaching in the hands of the students. What do you do as a teacher? You create lesson plans, correct? Why don't you allow the students to create the lesson plan? Why, is there, why can't their homework not be answer question five, a through C. Why can't it be write a lesson on the multiplication le lesson? And that's your homework. And that's the first step because what you're gonna do after you write that lesson is to go in front of the class and teach it. And the student will, teach, will sit there and teach and the teacher will sit in the student's seat. And the teacher will not interrupt the student when they're teaching unless what they're saying is scientifically or mathematically or in English or social studies incorrect. But allow them to be on the stage because graffiti tells us that there's an eternal search for fame and a search for voice and a search for power and a search for agency. And the way that you can do that is by putting the student at the helm of the classroom because I hate to break it to you. As a teacher, you're the expert in content. But the student is the expert in the delivery of, the, of, of information. You know more information. I'm not saying replace teachers. No one knows more than you. You've gone through schools, you've learned your stuff. But they know how to share said information. And so by giving them the opportunity to prepare the lesson and bring it forth to the classroom, one, you're empowering them, but two, you're understanding reality pedagogy. Because you're learning how to teach by watching the student in process. My best examples as a teacher came from me watching students. When I tried to get through, you know, it's like, this is like Newton's Laws of Motion even. When I tried to get through Newton's Laws of Motion, and I had example upon example. Imagine a car crash. Imagine if there was a helicopter, and then you, I had all these imaginative ways, and then I gave the kids a lesson, and the kid was like, so you know what it is, son? Like, let's use riding the train, right? And we on a, on a four train, and then a, the um, conductor hits the emergency brake. You know how you keep going? And I was like, um, yes. Yes, that's what I meant to say. But guess what? By giving the student that opportunity, the other four classes I had for the rest of the day had a great example from me, right? And, and, and that is reality pedagogy, giving the students an opportunity to co-teach. Here's a short clip of that in action. Okay, so we'll stop there. Let me describe that sequence. The teacher was teaching. We had enacted this co-teaching lesson where the kids created a lesson plan. And it got to a point where they were so comfortable where they were videotaping the lesson, and he was teaching, and she was like, um, hold up. Let me see if Nikki will understand it my way, because your way is not working, right? And so she gets up, walks in front of the classroom, grabs the marker from him, and the kid who's recording says, um, excuse me, Mr. Leanna, because you're getting in the way of us teaching and learning here, <laughs> right? And, and starts the lesson. That can be a part and parcel of your practice if you enact this co-teaching process where the kids at the ready are always prepared for the lesson because they never know when they're gonna have an opportunity to teach. Co-teaching. The third C, cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism. It's, it's, it's rooted in a, a larger philosophical tenet that means that ind individuals have a co-responsibility for each other. Uh, Kwame Appiah wrote this book, Ethics in the World of Strangers, where he was saying, like, all of us in the world are connected to each other. And if we're all connected to each other, in the classroom, you have to be able to pick up on that and create something like it. This is an element from gang culture that we can use in the classroom. Yes, I said elements of gang culture to be used in the classroom. Yes, I did say it, right? And, and what it is is you make the classroom a, a space, a pseudo family, for you who are embedded in a structure where they're oftentimes broken homes for larger societal reasons that if I started talking about, we wouldn't get out of here tonight. Um, but, but in those spaces, it is necessary to create a familial structure in the classroom. How do you do that? Give the classroom a name. I'm not, this is not just class 707. This is class 707 of science OGs. This is like, you, you create a name. It, it, it's an identifier. It's a marker of connection. What else does hip hop teach us about how people are commit, co uh, connected to each other? The handshake. I, I remember once, I, the first time I went to South Africa to conduct my research, there were a bunch of professors and then three students. And I shook into the other professor's hands in a traditional way. Thank you, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Now I go to the students and I got one of these. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the same handshake from Brooklyn. Like, it, it, was, it was a powerful moment. But, but what they were doing or what they were saying without saying anything was like, I'm with you. It's a Jay-Z line when he goes, I put my hand on my heart and he said, I feel you, a real re recognized real and you're looking familiar. Yes, I just said Jay-Z and Kwame Afia in the same presentation, forgive me. But it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a marker that I'm with you. And so in the classroom, the handshake has such a, like this is teacher, teacher Education 101. In your class, with you, you have to have your own class handshake. It's a traditional handshake, just add two, three moves to it when somebody gets an answer right. And what that does is it creates a connection with the youth in the classroom to you and to the subject that allows you to be able to share culture. Not only just share culture, but create a hybridized culture where yourselves are embedded in the teaching and learning process. Cosmopolitanism. The fourth C, context. And context is taking what hip hop has told us about the block and the streets and the corners and using that in the classroom by saying, instead of having the back of the classroom be uh, the science center, make the back of the classroom be the corner of First and 14th Street. Like, name the place in the classroom a place in the community. And it seems silly, but what that does is it makes the worlds outside and the worlds of inside collide in a really interesting, powerful way. It's when you're teaching a lesson on photosynthesis, don't just use a picture from the textbook. Go into the community, find the closest garden of flowers, take that picture and put it in. And when you're teaching, say, oh, I got this from the corner of, I got this from this park. Blurring the divides between the classroom world and the out of classroom world. Because those are the, those contextual cognitive anchors are what are, is the seedbed for true learning. So context, and then last, Yes, last is content. Last. Because as instructors, we've always put content first. Let them understand the content. Let them understand the content. Let them understand the content. And nobody's getting the darn content. If you can connect you with youth in classrooms through the other four C's, and then use the content, but not only use the content, but use content in a way that you express your, 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 the fact that you don't have all knowledge. Your part of the reason you don't engage is because they think teachers have all the knowledge. The most powerful thing for a young person is when they pose a question to the teacher in the class and the teacher says, wow, I don't know. Because you, you, they, they realize that they have power. They feel like they've trumped you. Then what do you do as an instructor? You take that question and you put it up in the classroom and you collect all the questions no one knows. One of the biggest issues in education that no one has focused on, it's like underlying, but it's like killing people, is misinformation. I had a student tell me once, my science teacher told me there were 11 planets. And I was like, no. <laughs> right? And he was willing to argue with me because like, that's what my teacher said. And teachers in the moment, because we've been told that we are the sages, feel like we can't express vulnerability in the fact that we don't have all information. I can give you any given textbook. I can give you my book, which you should buy, by the way, because it's amazing. Um, <laughs> But I can give you my book, and I, I don't know everything that's in the book I wrote. I, I'm, I don't. I can give you any textbook. Nobody who wrote a textbook who authors a textbook knows all the information. There's research. There, there are fact-getters. There are editors that come through in that process. If that's the case with how knowledge is built, you don't have to tell kids lies about what you do or don't know. I don't know. That is a powerful pedagogical moment. So those are the five C's. Let's move towards hybridized culture. Man, this is fun stuff, but I know I need to get time for questions, right? So the Obama effect, it's in the book. Now it's all book plugs. I talk about the Obama effect in my amazing book, Urban Science Education for the Hip Hop Generation. Um, and in closing, that, and that's the title of the amazing book, Urban Science Education for the Hip Hop Generation. So that, that is my book. You can reach, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, my website is www.chrisemden.com. Um, the hashtag for every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, we have pedagogues from across the globe, literally across the globe, who converge on Twitter to have conversations about how they can use hip hop and structures from hip hop in their classrooms. Tuesdays at 9 p.m., it started with two people, it evolved to hundreds of people, and no question is too silly like, what exactly is the cipher? will get answered, as well as questions like, how can I use uh, the fourth line from Jay-Z's first album in my English lesson? And that's also allowed. So, those are my contact information. That is my book. I'm ready to answer questions. And thank you guys so much for having me.